Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My very special guest on this episode is Brenda Hill Skillstad. You might not know her name, but you're going to know her story. It's the story of a woman who stood up to a powerful company, and as a result of her six-year battle 20 years ago, she has single-handedly become responsible for anti-slap lawsuits, lawsuits that get filed by powerful interests to keep quiet people who protest or speak out. Uh, and her state of Washington passed an anti-slap law as a result of her experience, and many, many states around the country have followed in the example of Washington ever since then. 17 states still have yet to pass the law, and Brenda's got something to say about that too. It's a very special episode with the person responsible for one of the most important whistleblower uh, developments in recent history. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Stay tuned. My guest today on Good Law, Bad Law is Brenda Skillstad, uh, a citizen of our country who 20 years ago uh, was involved in a case that is responsible for having changed the law in, in now half the states in the country in a very, very important way. She is a whistleblower, and I uh, know she may be shy about that term, but she is a whistleblower in the truest sense. And so I want to thank you, Brenda, very, very much for being on the program today. Thank you so much for having me. We, we're we going to talk about your case and your experience, Brenda, uh, in uh, uh, a lawsuit that you were involved in back in 1987. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it led, the experience you had in that case led to a, a law in your home state uh, that prohibited what are called SLAP lawsuits, strategic lawsuits against public Participation, S L A P P. Uh, do you want to just g give a brief description of what a slap lawsuit is, and 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 then we'll get into the full story of what what happened to you? Absolutely, slap <clears throat> stands for strategic lawsuit against public participation, and so so it is designed to intimidate whoever it is that's coming forward, and so. Um, that is that is what that stands for. So this would be a case, say, that a very powerful company or entity would file to really intimidate and 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 stifle uh, somebody, a citizen, usually an individual, without anything like the the power and resources of the company bringing this type of case to basically shut them up from talking about something that may make them look bad. Absolutely. Um, so t t tell us a little bit about yourself right now. Tell us where, where, where you live and what you do. And, and then I do want to get into the details of, of the case that, that paved the way for this. But just give us a bit of background on yourself now. Um, right now, I, I live in a place called Cookville, Tennessee. It is, it's between Knoxville and Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm from Seattle. And so... It, in some ways, I feel like I've taken a time machine 50 years back. It's very, very different. Um, mm -hmm. I'm caring for, I'm caring for um, my mother, who just had a malignant brain tumor removed, and they could not get it all. Oh boy! And it literally it, it sent her almost immediately into dementia. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have been trying to care for her, and and my dad's health isn't that great either. So um, that's kind of what I'm doing. I spend a lot of hours on, on Twitter. To me, um, it is a way to connect with other whistleblowers from around the world, mm -hmm. um, as well as journalists and politicians around the world. So for me, it is a, a huge tool. Um, I have 80 some whatever fall is 80,000 followers. Wow. And every connection to me is very, uh, I just am very honored for every single connection. And, 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 what, I, you're, and what you're connecting with people about is, is this issue, right? This is something you still 
uh, consider important and and something you're still fighting for. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, I am constantly um, not only looking for stories um, on my own, but a lot of times I'm posting things from other whistleblower uh, websites or or things that are that are posted. I think that are really relevant. Um, I I do post things about the military. I'm a uh, my daughter is a veteran. My son in law is a veteran, and I have a son in federal law enforcement. So I'm very interested in law enforcement things as well. But my primary focus is on whistleblower and First Amendment issues. Well, I've <clears throat> I've done a lot of uh, cases over the years involving uh, brain tumors and brain cancer. So first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry that uh, your mom and and your family is is struggling through that. I know. I know how devastating uh, a disease brain cancer is, and and it affects everybody in the family, of course. Um, and I've done a lot of work on whistleblower cases too, so I was also very interested in your story and and the really historic place you have in in relation to this important kind of whistleblower protection statute these these anti slap lawsuits. So. Uh, uh, let's talk about what happened. You're going to have to take us back in time, 20, 20 years to 1987. Uh, tell us, tell us where you were at that time and, and where you were living and, uh, and what was going on that led to uh, your, your becoming involved in this whole issue. Absolutely. In 1984, my ex-husband Gary and I bought our dream home. It was a, a four-bedroom Cape Cod, and it was perfect. Um, at the time, I did not know that I was pregnant with my our third child. And so in 1986, when the interest rate dropped, because what we did is we, sent, we signed a private contract. It was a 10 years, um, a 10 year contract. So we had five years at 12%. Mm-hmm. And then and the next five years was going to be at 9%. And so in 1986, when the interest rates dropped, it was definitely in our best interest to do whatever we could to get our contract um, refinanced. Right. And so that is actually what started my journey in the process of, of that. Um, and and I, where, were you li- I, where were you living at the time, Brenda? Was this in Seattle? Vancouver, Washington. Oh, in Vancouver. Okay. Yes, Vancouver, Washington, um, just over the bridge from Portland, Oregon. So, in the process of, of finding all of uh, finding out that wanting to refinance, and then finding out that the excise tax had never been paid. Um, in some states, it's called a transfer tax, but it was called a excise tax in Washington State, and it's basically your sales tax on a home when you sell it. And it's, it's something that is the, the seller's responsibility. And so. And so who, I, who was uh, it? Who, who was it? Who hadn't paid the excise tax? Um, the real estate company that we bought the home from on a real estate contract. Um, I had no idea that there were over 300 of us n- never dreamed that it was going to end up being the largest investigation in the history of the state of Washington. Oh, my gosh. So so what I'm understanding so far, Brenda, is that you bought this house, and it was in a development of about several hundred homes, and the real estate owner that you bought from and all these hundreds of other people bought from hadn't been paying their excise tax or their sales transfer tax. Is is that right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. There, there were uh, several subdivisions. Um, that were that were effective. Okay. So what's the next? So once you went, so so you needed to refinance your particular uh, loan agreement, and how did that lead you to discover that that all these taxes hadn't been paid? I actually went when the interest rates dropped in 1986 to nine, I believe eight percent, if I remember correctly. Um, because our contract was five years at 12 or 9% and then five years at 12%. And then we had to cash them out. Um, it, we wanted to refinance. And mm-hmm. I remember um, I went to a mortgage company and there was a very um, 
heavy set gentleman sitting behind the desk and I showed him my contract and he got kind of a smirk on his face, which made me really nervous. And he said, Oh, another one of these. Mm. <laughs> he said, you might want to start at the courthouse. And I thought that was just as bizarre as anything could be. Right. Um, not only did we buy the house on a real estate contract, but my husband's boss, his wife was the salesperson. So that added an extra level of um, making us more comfortable and, and it, every, being, being sing, seeming more on the up and up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was only 21 at the time, and, and Gary was 23. So we really didn't know that you needed an go through escrow or, or a title company or anything. None of that was something we were familiar with. And so we were, you know, we were very trusting. And in April and in um, October, we would send our property tax money into the office. We didn't even know that that was something that we should have been, you know, sending directly to the county. So in the, in the, I went to the courthouse and I wrote down my address and I asked the lady, um, you know, something about the property. And she said, are you sure you gave me the correct address? Because your name's not on this anywhere. Hmm. I, I can't find your name any place. And I found, I found that to be extremely um, scary and concerning because by then we've been living in the house for two years. Right. And you're, and about, so to have a, went, you're about to have a baby. And I mean, you're, yeah. I mean it must, must have been yeah. very stressful to have this... Uh, you know, this huge question mark now about, about your home. Absolutely. So after I left the courthouse, I went to the, to the office of the real estate company and I, I was asking him about, you know, what I had been told. And so he, he, he pulled out the contract, a copy of my contract. And he said, is this the, the contract that you and your husband signed? And I said, yes. And, um, he said, well, it says right here, you know, it's the party requesting recordations responsibility to pay the tax. And at this time, Mrs. Hill, we are not requesting that this contract be recorded. So if you want to want to go pay that excise tax, then mm-hmm. you need to go do that. And that was not when I, in fact, when I went back to the courthouse and talked to someone in the Treasury Department, she said, I find it very odd that they would tell you that you're responsible for um, for paying this because it's it's thirteen hundred dollars and they should have paid that. Right. Okay. So what? So, so, so then, what happened? She actually recommended that I write a letter to the Department of Revenue and send a copy of my contract, which I did. A few weeks later, I received a letter from the Department of Revenue, signed by Mr. Dave Johnson out of Olympia. And he said it would be most helpful if you would get us the names, addresses, and phone numbers of the other homeowners in your same situation. Mm. So armed with that letter, I decided, um, it, I thought, you know, what are we talking about? My subdivision, I knew there was one more subdivision that we had looked at a house um, previous to choosing our home. So I knew there was two subdivisions. So I thought, I thought, this isn't going to be a big deal. I could have dinner on the table, and then I could just go and knock on, you know, 25, you know, doors a night, and I could get this information to them. I had no idea that there was well over 350 of us. I had no idea what I was really getting into. So when I watched the movie Aaron Brockovich, I cried because I remembered going and knocking on those doors and i remembered it just it just brought back a lot of emotion for right. me there's these great scenes in that movie where she's knocking on doors to to let people know that their water their drinking water might be affected absolutely absolutely and so is that what you did you went to 300 and some homes and and got names and addresses and so on and then passed that on to the uh to the folks in olympia washington I think I stopped at about 200 and something. I think that I started kind of feeling very overwhelmed about that point. There was a point where the real estate company found out I was the one that was 
you know, kind of stirring up things. And they called me into the office and set me down. And I notified the Department of Revenue prior to agreeing to the meeting they wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. Um, James Tapio is the office manager. He looked at the clock on the wall and he said, Mrs. Hill, he said, we could go at this. We could go right now. There is time still today. We can go right now and pay your excise tax. Would you agree to, to just stop what, everything you're doing and just let us go and take care of your home right now? Oh, and I said, what about the other homeowners that you're going to tell the same thing? You're going to tell them, well, if you want to pay it, then you go pay it. And I said, so no, I'm not going to be silent. You're not going to make me be silent. And I, I'm just trying to imagine the look on his face when you, when you sat there and, and said that to him. They must, yeah, they must have was, been pretty surprised. Yes, yes. He was shocked that I said that. And when I said that you can't make me be silent, um, I had no idea what I was about to face. Right. Okay. So take us to the next chapter then, Brenda. What happened next? I had contacted Mr. Johnson of the Department of Revenue and I said, look, instead of all these homeowners going and getting an attorney to find out what this really means to them, how it's going to affect them as, as people that are purchasing these homes, why couldn't your agency um, come and, and you know, in like a school auditorium, just get these homeowners together and allow them to just ask their questions and, and their concerns specifically in relation to department of your department dealing with excise tax. And Mr. Johnson spoke to his supervisor and it was agreed. And this meeting was scheduled um, at a high school auditorium and everything was, was going great. And that was scheduled for July 16. 1987. So okay. what I wasn't expecting was the knock on the door that I was going to receive two nights prior to that. Okay. A knock on the door. Okay. That's, that's sounding pretty ominous. Tell us, tell us what happened then. Okay. So I'm, I'm busy putting my kids down for, for bed. Um, at that time, my kids were um, two, three and four, I believe. And, and so, um, you know, that was my world. I didn't care anything about politics or law. I had never registered to vote, and I really honestly couldn't care less about any of were, it. And you were 21 years old at this point, or 20? Yes, yes. Right? In my world, all I knew is I'd had um, two years plus of diapers, and I, my focus was on um, working on my last child, so that would stop. And so anyway, yes. So we were at 8 o'clock at night, um, I'm served with these papers, and I'm I'm just holding them, and I'm freaking out. And at the very bottom of of these papers is a, a subpoena. And so the subpoena was for at eight o'clock the very next morning. And I, I had no attorney, no money. Um, my husband's supposed to be at work at eight a.m. Right. And so I, I burst into tears, feeling very overwhelmed. So you were so at eight o'clock or so in the evening, you're putting your kids down and you get a knock on the door and you're served with a subpoena to appear yes. uh, the next morning to do what to, to appear in, at, 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 at what was the what were you being subpoenaed to do? Um, I don't remember the exact the exact wording that was on the subpoena. I just remember that it said we were supposed to appear at eight o'clock the next morning. Um, the first, and I did call an attorney that night that I had approached specifically um, in relation to the possibility of filing a, if it was if it was necessary mm -hmm. to file a class action lawsuit against the real estate company, and so Mr. Higgins agreed, um, more out of pity for me, to to show up. He was very honest before the hearing. He said, "Look, um, you're a sweet lady." Um, you know, but you don't have any money. So this is this is the end of what I'm willing to do for you is to to show up at the hearing. He told me I had no choice but to agree to the to the gag order. Oh, boy. So 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 this is the first we're hearing about a gag order. What as you went to the hearing, what did you come to understand was going on? How did how was this happening at all? I I was stunned. I'd never been in a courtroom in my entire life. 
um, you know, other than watching Perry Mason, didn't even know what one looked like. And um, and the first things that, that their attorney said to the judge was, look, if we don't shut her up, she's going to ruin us. And so I was told by Mr. Higgins, you don't have a choice. You've got to agree to this, to this temporary restraining order. And, um, and this was, this and just day, so we're clear, just so we're clear, Brenda, this was, this was a request to restrain you to keep you quiet that was filed by the real estate company. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes, so they hold, they filed, hold you into court to basically shut you up. Absolutely. They, okay. they told the judge, if we don't shut her up, she's going to ruin us. And so Mr. One, uh, Mr. Uh, 90210, that is the Beverly Hills zip code of, of the real estate attorney who was the one that was after me, um, Warren Ashman, um, 90210 is not only his office, but his home zip code. Um, mm -hmm. So my Goliath was going to do everything he could to, to shut me up. And he was very vocal about that to the press. Okay, so so the judge and the judge entered that gag order, right? The judge required you to be quiet at that point. Absolutely, he's. It's. This, I remember that the order said, not only myself and my husband, but anyone quote acting in concert with me. Mm. Um, I don't know who that was supposed to be, but that was what was in the order. Okay. All right. So what? So tell us what happens next. Okay. So. So I, I'm I'm absolutely beyond myself trying to understand what all of this means. You know, I, I didn't have an attorney I could call up and ask any questions. Um, so what happened after that is I didn't even know we had defamation coverage. Um, initially, I was being sued for one hundred thousand dollars defamation. Wait a and second. so I think we skipped over something here. So so there's a gag order and and. Then you come to understand that the company is suing you for defamation. I was served with both both documents, oh not God. only the subpoena, but also notification of the lawsuit um, that same evening. And the and the reason th th they were suing you for defamation had the had the Washington state authorities already uh, imposed a fine on the company for the failure to pay these taxes. Had that already no. happened? Okay, so that happens yeah. later. So they're still just yeah. trying to stop you from going around door to door and, and, and getting people involved in this. Is that what was going on? Right, exactly. Yes. And um, what I, to this day, do not understand, and maybe you as an attorney can help me understand, is how in the world that, that um, temporary restraining order went from being worded a TRO, sorry, I'm um, and ended up being uh, six years, six years of my life with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I still to this day do not understand how. So, so what do you, temporary Brenda, explain what you mean by that? Six years of your life, me meaning what? what? What was it that took six years? Okay, so what happened was um, it took six years to get the case um, to a jury trial. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And in fact, um, I had a attorney that volunteered to file a defamation suit against them um, based on a three page letter they sent out to all 300 and some home, some home. Anyway, they sent it out mm -hmm. to all 300 homeowners insulting me by name, mm -hmm. um, saying that I was responsible for the demise of their real estate company. It's all my fault. And so I was able to have an attorney that was willing to file a, loss, a defamation lawsuit against them as well. At some point, Brenda, the, the developer, the, the real estate owner, was fined by the, the Washington state government for almost half a million dollars, right? That, for, for all the unpaid taxes for all those hundreds of homes. Absolutely. Um, the estimate, this is really interesting. Sorry, I'm going to go outside. Um, so the estimate, I'm sorry, I'm going to go outside. That's okay. 
Okay, so so the state of Washington estimated that what was owed was four hundred seventy seven thousand dollars, and they settled on three hundred and fifty one thousand. Okay, so that's how much they never owed. under. That's how much they eventually paid. In other words, yes, the estimate okay. was four seventy seven. And meanwhile, they sued you for defamation, uh, and 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 that was just for speaking out about what was going on. And so, when we talk about these slap lawsuits, the slap lawsuit here in this case was the lawsuit they filed against you to keep you quiet. Right? Absolutely, yes, okay. yes. And 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 this thing dragged on for for six years. Uh, before what? Before you were able to get the case? Before you and your lawyer were able to get your case to to a jury trial? Is that is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. If you would allow me to back up for just one sure. second and to okay. tell you this, and that is that when I met the attorney representing me, um, through the homeowners policy, um, the first thing you got to picture this. I'm 21 years old. I'm terrified. And I sit there and this man looks at me and he says, if you ever talk to the press, if you ever do anything I tell you not to do, if you talk to somebody from the state, he said, I will write on your file that you were not cooperative and you will walk in that courtroom alone. Do you understand? Mm. I mean, this is my first conversation with this man. And I was utterly, utterly um, terrified. Um, And. And so what happened is after that, um, and he kept telling me to let sleeping dogs lie, which I'd never heard of that before, but it really got old. Yeah. Um, so in finding out that they had sent that, that um, letter out, three-page letter to 350-some homeowners, well, I'm sitting there with a gag order, and I'm sitting there with a defamation suit. Not only that, but my hometown newspaper, the Columbia newspaper, if you, as long as you are an advertiser, it doesn't matter what you do. They, they're actually going to go on your side. So I, I had my own paper that, that was saying, um, you know, that I had brought all this on myself and um, things like that. The uh, articles that I, I couldn't even respond to, to what was being said. And so, I mean, I felt like I was coming, had, I had homeowners call me and say, we don't want you here, throwing toilet paper in my yard, throwing eggs at my car, eggs at my home. Um, And so, I mean, to say that my life was upside down is an understatement. Um, But after the three-page letter, I looked at my husband and I said, you know what? I am tired of being told to be quiet. And I don't care if I walk in the courtroom by myself. I am going to pick up the phone and talk to the Seattle press. And that was, that was a turning point for me. It really, really was. I can mm-hmm. never thank them enough because in calling the, in fact, the, the Seattle PI right. was the largest, yes. second largest in the country. And he thought I was a nutcase. He really did. When I called to tell him about my story, and so he actually sent a reporter to my home. And after that reporter went through my documents and asked me all the pertinent questions, he called his editor and he said, Brenda, we were actually sitting at a restaurant. And he said, order anything you want off of that menu. The paper's paying for it. Oh we're gosh. doing this story. So, so Okay. So then, and then I assume they did do the story and you finally got a chance to talk about your side of the story and what had happened and why you did what you did. Yes, sir. Um, both papers, ironically, the Times and the PI, um, my story ended up on the front page of one of them and be one of the other on the very same day. And everything changed um, for me. Um, I, I understood I needed to be very careful what I said. Mm-hmm. And I never said anything that was, not true anyway, but I, I understood I needed to be even more cautious in what right. I said in answering their questions. So you say that this was a turning point and that everything changed once you uh, spoke to this newspaper reporter and they published the story. Describe for us how things did change after that point. Well, um, 
for the first time in my life, I started feeling other people called me. They said, we want you to know we're here for you. Mm. Um, people were amazing. I could not believe it. Um, I had one of the Seattle TV stations, King 5, actually flew me to Seattle to do an interview. Um, but what was most remarkable was being able to testify before the House and the Senate. Um, about what I had gone through, because I never wanted anyone to get that knock on the door in the middle of the night and, and not have a dime to their name and no attorney, nobody there to, to say, don't do this, don't do that, say this, but don't say that. Um, whether it was dealing with the press or it was dealing with anything, I felt like everyone but me knew the rules. I mean, I, I felt so over my head. A lot of times if I had a question, I would go to the law library and, and just hope that I could find a sympathetic attorney to at least maybe answer one or two of my questions because I was that desperate. I, had, I wasn't like Aaron Brockovich. There was no, um, you know, go into the office and get your questions an answered and, and have some kind of um, support available to you. I didn't have it. It wasn't there. So, so, and and you got a chance to testify to the to the state house of representatives and the state senate about. I did. Was this before your your lawsuit was resolved, or or while the, your lawsuit was still going on? My lawsuit was still going on, mm -hmm. and I was yes, I was able to um, to go in to testify before the house and senate and explain to them what I had gone through. And my determination to make sure nobody ever went through what I went through. I lined my babies up on the Capitol steps and picketed the governor. And with as much passion um, as I had for that, I also um, picketed the attorney general. All I wanted was um, somebody to actually um, help me in my fight to make sure that, that nothing that I went through was ever going to be repeated there was no ACLU. There was nobody there for me. Right. Um, I kind of learned as I went, and I could never have imagined that that law would be the first in the country. Yeah, and I want to get to that. So, the but, but I think we need to finish first with what happened with your case, because I know for six years, you're uh, not only trying to be a mother to your small children and, and uh, you know, raise your family and be in your home, but you're now fighting this fight and facing a court date in your in your case where they are alleging where they're claiming that uh, you should have to pay them a lot of money for defamation. So so what happens at the end of that six year time period when you do finally get to court in your case? Um, yes, I am so happy to tell you what happened. <laughs> yes. um, we have to hear this. This is the good news. <laughs> I had, I actually heard somebody tell, talking about a little known law, um, which if there, I think it's 16 months, if there has never been any movement on a case for 16 months, it may be 18 months, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. that the clerk has the right to petition the judge in the interest of space um, to, to uh, petition that judge to to file a motion that goes to both attorneys that saying, look, either move it or lose it. Right, this case right. has been sitting here long enough. And so I called the clerk's office and I said, ma'am, I want to know what your favorite cookies are. And she said, what in the world do you want to know that for? And I said, because I'm bringing them to you. Um, I said, I need to ask you a favor. And she said, ma'am, no one has ever asked. And in the, in the 20 years I've worked in, as a clerk, um, here at the courthouse, no one has ever called and asked that I file that motion before the judge. I will do that for you. Mm. And so behind my behind my attorney's back, um, didn't tell anybody what I was doing, but I I was so happy when um, the attorneys received the notice, you know, that the judge was going to dismiss that lawsuit because you have to understand, I went six years feeling like it was over my head six years, like feeling like um, that I just wanted to be able to go on with my life. I don't even know how, I don't even know how to describe to you 
what what it was like to go through what I went through. Um, I lost my home. I lost everything. Mm. Um, yeah. And so I just wanted to be able to turn the chapter once and for all. Well, that $100,000 lawsuit at some point got changed to $1.2 million. And I cannot even tell you when that happened because I don't remember being notified that they were suing me for $1.2 million. Um, I got a phone call from the attorney on the case I had filed against them. And he said, Brenda, I have good news. He said, if you will drop your case against them, they are willing to go to mediation on the case against um, I, that you have filed against them. And I thought, wow, this is great. I can, you know, I can get on with my life and this is going to be over. Finally, it's going to be over. Right. Well, I no more than cast that check. Um, and it was, I don't care if I'm not supposed to tell you because I'm going to tell you. $15,000 is what I settled on for what was extensively six years of my life. Right. And of course, the attorney, rightfully so, is going to take his part and then whatever. So what am I looking at? $8,000 when it was all right. said and done? Not okay, so, so I'm happy that, that it's over, right? You, you, so think it's all, you think you settled and you're all done. You can now get on with things. Right. And you would think that my attorney got that in writing, but he did not. So next thing I know, I'm served yet again. Um, that they are moving forward on their case. And it's going to be a five-day jury trial trial and I'm being sued for 1.2 million dollars mm -hmm. so so all that got settled it sounds like was your claim against them for defamation for that letter that they circulated all throughout your neighborhood that's what they gave you fifteen thousand dollars for is that right correct but they didn't that's but correct. they and I guess your lawyer also didn't settle and make go away the real estate company's lawsuit against you. Now a, a, a case they're cha they're claiming you owe over a million dollars for. Correct. Oh boy. Correct. So here I am. I'm bringing, you know, peanut butter jelly sandwiches and a can of Pepsi with me to to the courthouse for five straight days. I'm wearing clothes that are borrowed from a neighbor um, to go to this trial, and um, and uh, sorry. My my nine oh two one oh Goliath shows up and you know, he's got his Rolex watch and whatever else and and um so I won twelve to zero but walked away with nothing. Mm. You won your case, but it cost you six years of your life. It did. It did. I never there was never nobody cut me a check unless you want to count the eight thousand dollars. Of, mm -hmm. of signing my ability to counter sue and, and get something to show for all those years. And so to me, that whistleblower law that is named after me, the Brenda Hill whistleblower law, um, is all I have. And it is a, a you can't take that from me. Um, you can take, <laughs> there's nothing left to take from me, but that. <laughs> Law means everything to me. And um, so where, where we are right now is there are 17 states without excuse that are, are, are lazy. They don't see the need to protect their citizens. And I'm coming for every one of them. Um, so we've got 17 states that have decided it's not important to, to enact an anti-slap lawsuit. And to me, this is 2018, and I am just furious beyond words. That well, before, we, before to we get to the before we get to those 17 states, and I'm I'm going to ask you to name them too, if you would, as many as yes. you can. Uh, but before we get there, I mean, there aren't that many people that can say that they have a law named after them. Uh, you have right. that honor, and I know it. I know it came at a great cost, and, and you paid a big price for it, but. You, you have to you have to finish that part of the story, Brenda. Tell us how the Brenda Hill whistleblower law in Washington came about, the very first anti-slap law in the country. How did that happen, and how did it come to be named after you? It, it happened because I refused to be silent as far as I was concerned. Not only was I fighting a 
millionaire real estate attorney. But as far as I was concerned, I was fighting my own state. Um, the minute that lawsuit was filed against me, the state that had agreed to show up for those homeowners um, at that meeting, they, um, the, the real estate, my, my 90210 Goliath called and said, I don't want you there. Um, mm. There's no reason for you to show up. So they left those homeowners holding the bag. So and that they, meeting that meeting that was supposed to happen in that high school auditorium two days after you were served with that subpoena, you're saying that that meeting with all the homeowners so they could ask their questions and understand what was going on and what their rights were, that meeting never actually took place? That meeting did take place, but the state was not there. I the see. only thing that happened was the 300 and some homeowners, I, I think 200 of them showed up had to listen to excuses by my my 901, my 90210 Goliath, mm -hmm. listen to their attorney make a bunch of excuses. Um, the state from that point on, and this was one of the most devastating things for me, they said, without you, Mrs. Hill, we would have never had our investigation. And we can't thank you enough, but we, on the advice of our attorney, um, we can no longer speak to you. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know how I could put that into words for you, what that made me feel like, um, with, you know, like kind of thank you, but no thank you, go away. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. So my you, entire life. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Your entire life. What? I was just going to say my entire life just got turned upside down. And, and so this, and my state just turned its back on me and I could not believe that in the United States of America, not only had I been served at 8.30 8 p.m. at night, um, and those papers, by the way, were, were filed that same day, July 14th. So, um, so Brenda, you single-handedly put over $300,000 into the Washington State uh, you know, uh, bank account because you forced this powerful real estate company to pay taxes that they had avoided paying. You single-handedly took down a big real estate company in a six-year litigation in a 12-to-0 jury verdict against a, a, a Beverly Hills millionaire attorney. Uh, you, you, you lost your home. You, 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 you spent six years of your life with this. As you say, it turned your life upside down. Uh, you lost your home. Um, you, 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 know, you pretty much lost everything. Uh, but you, but in the end, you, this law is passed in Washington state to make sure that what happened to you shouldn't happen to other people too, by powerful interests looking to keep people quiet. You have the very first anti-slap lawsuit, lawsuit or anti-slap lawsuit law passed in the country and named after you. How, when, when did that all happen? Was that after you won your case after the six year uh, lawsuit that you had to fight? No, the jury trial I had was um, in March of 93. Mm -hmm. That law is um, a night, it was actually filed in, I mean, uh, signed into law in 1989. Mm, okay. All right. Yes. So, and then so after that happened, uh, after that law is passed in 1989 in Washington, were you active in in trying to help other states get get the message and pass similar laws? Um, you know, I I felt like I was I was hampered um, as far as you know really having um, money to go and do the things I so desperately wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and so so honestly, it's been. Um, the last few years that I have really, really um, picked up the, the, the gauntlet, if I said that right, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. again, and, and I am just fighting so hard for whistleblowers and for First Amendment issues. Um, I am so honored to daily be contacted by whistleblowers. 
throughout the world. And so right now, what I want to do is to continue to fight for First Amendment issues and whistleblower issues in particular. I am honored to be um, connected to um, Mr. Uh, Brandon Coleman in Washington, D.C. He is the VA uh, whistleblower advocate mm -hmm. for our veterans. And, and I to have his phone number in my phone and um, if there's a whistleblower that he cannot help because it's a private citizen matter, he mm -hmm. will give them my phone number and I will do whatever I can to, to help them. And one of the things that I have noticed with, you've got these different whistleblower foundations, but um, it concerns me that the, the um, networking together and everybody kind of, you know, we're all on the same team. Um, I don't get that sense and that breaks my heart. The other thing is um, what breaks my heart is that if you're a federal whistleblower or you are a state employee, there's all kinds of resources and help for you. But if you are just a, let's say, contractor and you notice that um, a builder's using subpar material that could possibly cause some damage to somebody down the road, there is very little um, protection, e even with those laws that are enacted. And I'm very grateful that mm -hmm. those laws are enacted. But what the problem is, is that that person is, goes through so much emotionally and possibly financially. And so I, I get really concerned as far as how much help really is there for for whistleblowers. To me, um, I'm honored to speak to, I don't care if they're federal, VA, um, any of them. To me, we're, we're part of the family and we should work together. Um, so my hope someday is to come up with the funds to start my own foundation and, and to work with not only what is already there, but to, um, I would love to fight on a national level for whistleblowers. And that is my dream. Well, and, and you, me. you know, you went alone most of the way. And, you know, there are lawyers who, who can help and who will take these kinds of cases. And just if people can find their way to a lawyer who will help them, I mean, that is a big, you know, that can make a big difference. Um, but, you know, there are lawyers who are willing to take on clients uh, who are the Davids against the Goliaths out there. And um, but you're right. A lot of people, you know, it's emotional, it's financial, it's stressful. Um, it's it's very hard to do what you did. Um, yes. And uh, uh, people need support and they need help and they need information in, in order to have the ability to. Uh, to stand up and and speak out when that's needed. Uh, so I think th I think that's uh, I think that's so incredibly important. Now you were you were starting to say a little bit ago, Brenda, that there are 17 states in the country still that don't have anti slap uh, laws on the books. Uh, what what are some of those states? We need to call them out right now. You need to call them out. Yes, yes I'm coming for them. Every right. single one of them. Give me one second. I put them put a list in my purse. Absolutely. So um, here's a list of those states. We've got Idaho. We have Montana, Alaska, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, um, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Kentucky, Ohio, Missouri, South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky. Um, if if uh, anybody is listening from one of those states, then I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to do whatever it takes because th there's no excuse. Um, so you, you, the, heard, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Brenda. I'm sorry. There's just absolutely no excuse. Again, I know I said it earlier. Um, it baffles me that with everything, there's not a day, there's not that there's an article. There's constantly articles about whistleblowers and what they've gone through. And for those states to carry so little so little about their citizens is such a slap in the face and to whatever extent i can um be an influence i i'm going to do it well i want to say 
uh, if you're in Alabama and Wyoming and Iowa and all these other states, these 17 states that Brenda just listed, uh, uh, and if you've been listening to this program, you know that Brenda is coming for you. And uh, so, Brenda, you know, continue the fight and spread the word and uh, take your 85,000 Twitter followers and double and triple that because you have an incredible story uh, of courage standing up to to the powerful. Um, when when the powerful can hire expensive lawyers and go to court and 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 use their power to try to silence somebody who's just speaking the truth uh, about something that's wrong. Uh, so uh, I, I wish you well. I thank you so much for sharing your story and I wish you good luck in everything you're doing. Thank you so much. It has been my deepest honor. Thank you. Thank you.